morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to our 10 a.m. virtual education program. My name is Rachel, education specialist here at the Topeka Zoo, and today we are going to be covering fourth grade curriculum. Now, before we get started, we do want to thank our sponsors, Topeka Collegiate and the Kokari Foundation, for sponsoring these classes. We appreciate it. So today, we are going to conclude our Structures and Animal Group sessions. Over the last four weeks, we have talked about structures, which is internal and external adaptations, um, things about the way plants and animals look and behave that allow them to survive. And we've talked about these structures over the vertebrate groups, the animals with the backbone. We've talked about mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, Unfortunately, we didn't really get to cover fish. However, today we are going to move to the most, the biggest animal group around the invertebrate. So today we are going to be talking about structures and animals who do not have a backbone. So invertebrate, when you hear me say that word a lot today, in means without, vertebrate means backbone. So these are animals that don't have any bones inside their body like we do. Now, when we were talking about all of the vertebrate animal groups, the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, the amphibians, and the fish, all of the vertebrate species in the world, there are about 60,000 of them that we have discovered. 60,000 differing species of animals with a backbone across those five animal groups. Well, invertebrates, there are at least 1.25 million species that we have discovered, and scientists estimate that that number could actually be very low. Some scientists think there are 5, 10, or even more millions of invertebrate species. So although they are oftentimes the littler animals that we have on our planet, they do make up the largest percentage of animal species in the world. In fact, 97% of the animal kingdom are invertebrates, or animals without a backbone. So some of the examples when I say invertebrates, we are talking about animals like jellyfish, these floating adorable animals that live in the ocean, or animals like worms that we love to use for our compost or we like to find as kids underneath the ground. There are also major animal groups that are invertebrates, like our mollusks. This is the term that we use to describe animals like our bivalves, or our oysters and our mussels. Our gastropods, which is a fancy word for slugs and snails. Our cephalopods, like our octopus and our squid. So all of the mollusks, all of these types of animals are invertebrates. They do not have a backbone. Same with our crustaceans, which is a fancy word for animals like barnacles shrimp, crabs. So like I said, most of the animal kingdom is made up of invertebrates and all invertebrates in the world are cold blooded. Now what I want to focus on today are our insects, arachnids, and myriapods because in just one second we are going to go inside of our bug zoo and meet some of our live uh, invertebrates in there. So insects, arachnids, and myriapods. These are animals who do not have a backbone, but they do have a skeleton on the outside of their body. This is what we call an exoskeleton. Now exo means outside, skeleton means bones, right? So an example of an insect is going to be this beetle. This beetle is encased in this hard exoskeleton, and those, those bones, they're made out of something called chitin. So it's a little bit different than our bones, but it provides similar functions. It protects that beetle from any predators or from drying out. It allows it to move across the ground easily. It holds all of its structures together. So as an insect, it has an exoskeleton. Now one of the easiest ways to identify insects is by counting their body parts. Insects are invertebrates who have three body parts. They have a head, which is on the front of their body. They've got their thorax, which is the second section. That is where their legs come off. And if they have wings, that is where the wings are. 
And then their third section is the abdomen. So insects have three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, and six legs. So that is an insect, three body parts, six legs, like this beetle. Now arachnids are one of my favorite groups of invertebrates, and it's animals like this tarantula. Now people sometimes don't like tarantulas because they are covered in hairs, but those hairs are an important structure in how they process the world. Tarantulas do have eyes, but that does not mean they see very well. So they need those hairs for two main reasons. One is they actually use those hairs as a defense. If a predator like a bird swoops in and tries to eat our tarantula, they use their back two legs and flick the hairs off of their abdomen into the eyes, the nose, the face of that predator. Now those hairs are coated in a wax that burns. And so by using those hairs as a defense, if those hairs got into the eye of a bird, it would be very painful and they would never try and eat a tarantula again. Now the other reason they have those hairs is actually to sense the world around them. Those hairs allow them to pick up on vibrations or sound movements of other things around them. So let's say this tarantula is out in the wild and those hairs start moving. They start picking up on big movements, big vibrations. This tarantula, via those hair, can feel in her body, ooh, something is coming. Those vibrations are set in her brain and she then knows that she needs to go and hide. Now, the same is true on the other end. Those vibrations can pick up on little movements as well. And so if there's a smaller animal, like a lizard or a small mouse around, she can feel it in those hairs and she says, ooh, lunch is ready, I'm gonna go attack it and eat it. So those hairs are a differing sense for her that allow her to pick up on the world around her and know how to find her food and to avoid predators, which is pretty fascinating. Now, as a tarantula, she is a spider and spiders are arachnids. So are scorpions, ticks, and mites. So arachnids are our animal group with two body parts and eight legs. So on arachnids, the head and the thorax of an insect are combined on the arachnids. So the cephalothorax is the first part and it has their eyes, their mouth parts, and all eight of their legs. And then the second part is the abdomen, just like it is on an insect. So arachnids, two body parts and eight legs. Now moving on to our final grouping of animals that I wanna talk about today. These are what we call myriapods, which is a fancy word for invertebrates who have more than three body parts and more than eight legs. So we're talking about animals like our millipedes and our centipedes. So this is an invertebrate. It does not have a backbone. And if you look closely at this picture, you will see that there's a variety of lines all along this millipede's body. Each one of those lines, those segments, represents another body part. So this millipede in this picture might have 20 to 25 body parts. Each one of these little segments are a differing body part. Now one way you can tell millipedes and centipedes apart has to do with the number of legs. Millipedes have two legs per segment, I'm sorry, four legs per segment of their body. They have two on each side. Centipedes, on the other hand, like this one on this uh, picture, they only have two legs per body part, one on each side. So it's a lot easier to see on the centipede, but just like the millipede, each one of these right here is a differing body part. So this centipede might have 20 body parts and 40 legs. Centipedes are also venomous, so you wanna be careful of these guys because they kill their prey by injecting a venom into it. So another way to identify it's a centipede and not a millipede, aside from the number of legs, is as you can see, centipedes' legs go out from the side of their body, whereas millipedes, their four legs per segment come out from underneath them. They don't shoot out the side like a centipede does. They're straight underneath. 
So my friends, invertebrates, animals without a backbone, are a huge grouping of animals. And they're ones that sometimes are misunderstood. People see a bug on the ground or a spider in their house and they're scared of it. They immediately scream, run away, and maybe even try and kill it. But invertebrates are very important in our ecosystems. Many of them are at the bottom of the food chain. They either eat plants or they eat smaller bugs or other types of invertebrates. And they are food for our bigger animals. If we didn't have our little invertebrates at the bottom of the food chain, we would not have any of the bigger, cuter animals that we love at the top. Although personally, I think a lot of the invertebrates are super cute as well. Spiders in particular are actually really good to have around because they control populations of other bugs like mosquitoes and flies. So if you have a spider in your house, as opposed to running away screaming and killing it, give it a name, welcome it to the family, and thank it for working and eating all of those other bugs. I always make a deal with my spiders when they're in my house. I say, as long as you don't go above or in my bed, you can live here, right? And so I think that's a pretty fair trade. And one time I had a spider who did go above my bed and I just put it in a cup and took it outside because even outside, they are stopping all of those other bugs from getting in. So when we talk about invertebrates, please remember that these guys, they may not be as charismatic and fun to watch as some of the bigger animals in the zoo, but they are just as important and make up a lot of our animal species. So for those of you who are in fourth grade, we have a worksheet. This worksheet goes over all of the animal groups that we have talked about over the last five sessions, including today. So we want you guys to, it's a, it's a worksheet challenging you on all of the structures that we've gone over for the animal groups. So for instance, listing which ones don't have a backbone, which are cold blooded, warm blooded, which ones are vertebrates, right? Circling the invertebrates. On the back, we have some true false questions and some matching questions. So this is just challenging you guys to really think about all of the structures we've learned thus far. As always, take a picture and put it in the comments. Alrighty friends, so we are getting ready to go inside into the zoo's bug zoo. It's actually one of my favorite locations because there are a variety of super neat invertebrates in there. So I'm gonna put on my mask and we're gonna go in and meet Riley, who is the keeper of the bug zoo, or one of them, and she's gonna show us around. So give me just one second to put this on. All right, let's head on in. rounds in the bug zoo. Riley, would you mind chatting a little bit about some of the animals we have in here? Sure. So welcome to the Shindle Bug Zoo. I'm Riley and I'm not the person who usually works in here. You'll usually find Joe or Shelly. Um, I think what most people probably don't know is that a lot of the bugs or animals here actually get the same amount of care as every other animal we have at the zoo. Um, whether they're a tarantula or a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so some of the animals that we have in here, uh, we have a variety of insects. Walk in, this is one of my favorite exhibits because as soon as you walk in, you see a huge colony of Madagascar hissing cockroaches. This is one of our insect species and they're super charismatic, super easy to identify. Um, and they have that characteristic hissing sound that they do as a way to defend them. Although they are completely harmless, it's just uh, trying to fake. Now, if we move on throughout some bug zoo, what do we have on this wall, Riley? So this is where uh, some of our tarantulas are. We have a Chaco Golden Knee tarantula, which he's right, right here for you, which is kind of rare. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a really good view of him. Yeah, from Argentina. Paraguay or South America, and they eat crickets. They get cricket times a week. He won't get fed a day though. They don't eat every day, they just eat a couple times a week. Which mimics their behaviors in the wild, right? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. What's in this next one? So I found him earlier. He's really hard to 
see. So this is our tailless whip score band. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, nice. You can probably almost see them. You just kind of see these little spindly legs. Mm -hmm. These guys are found all over the world, but mostly in the tropic areas. And again, like the tarantula, they only eat a couple times a week. He gets a small cricket. Alrighty, and above him, ooh, this is a beautiful, I haven't even actually seen this tarantula she's, yet. And yeah, unfortunately she's hiding. Okay. So I'm probably not going to dig her out just to leave her alone, but she's one of our, our curly hair tarantula. And Megan, if you want to show them the picture there, oh, you yeah, can there you see go. what she looks like. Yeah. And as their name states, they have curly hairs all over them. <laughs> and we just talked about the reason why tarantulas have hair in our lesson outside. Good. A lot of people think it's to keep them warm, but remember they're cold blooded. So it's not for that. It's for defense and as a way to pick up on vibrations. All righty, moving on. Ooh, a myriapod. So remember, we talked about our centipedes and our millipedes, and Riley's going to open this up for us yeah. to show you the largest millipede species in the world. These are the giant African millipedes. Now, I don't think ours are full grown yet. Ours are juveniles. Okay. Um, but they are found over in Africa, and they can get up to a foot long once they are full grown. And these ones don't fly, so you can take the lid off. <laughs> And can you talk about the food they have in there? Sure. They just got fed. They really like uh, really hydrating foods like oranges, cucumber, apple. Is that good light? Yeah. Um, yeah, they really like cucumber and apple a lot. So these guys, they eat fruits and veggies. Right, and as you guys can see, our animals here at the Topeka Zoo get really high quality produce. Um, those look like they came straight out of the grocery store. Mm, pretty much. Yeah, I would eat those. Not now that they're in dirt, but <laughs> the bugs don't care. Right. Um, so this is a, a species that is not venomous. Um, so remember, millipedes, those guys are herbivores. The centipedes are the ones that are venomous. So that is why Riley is holding the millipede. We yes. would not be holding a centipede. Probably not. <laughs> oh, there you go. And you can see that this millipede is kind of rolled up. Um, that is something that they do as a way to stay comfortable, and they use that hard exoskeleton as a defense. What's really cool about these guys is that all these little segments, they occasionally have beneficial uh, smaller arthropods that actually help clean between their segments. So it's actually beneficial for them to have a mite that does that. Hi, bud. You want to wake up? You woke him up from a nap. Right. <laughs> I'm slow moving when I wake up from a nap, too. Okay, well, he's going to be. Um, so, above Riley, up here, we have our blue death feigning beetles. So, this is a smaller species of insect that live over in um, like Arizona, New Mexico, places in the southwest United States. They live in the desert town. I just want to say that no. A lot of times when you play with them or pick them up, they'll actually pretend to be dead, just like playing possum. And that, even though they're actually pretty hard to bite into for most animals, this seems to be their main defense. And it works pretty well for them. Uh, they can live up to, this is one of the longest lived species of insects, maybe the longest, 
it can live up to 17 years. Whereas most insects only live sometimes a couple days to maybe a year and a half. Oh, we're gonna flip right over now. Yes, they're pretending, it was pretending like it was dead, right? But now it realizes Riley isn't a predator. And so it's comfortable to over and to kind of move about. Why are they called blue death painting beetles, Riley? That one doesn't look very blue. <laughs> um, they get a little damp. Sometimes they turn a little bit darker and I did just mist their habitat a little bit ago. Right, so they actually produce a substance that makes them, that they kind of uh, wipe all over their body that turns them blue. Um, and that allows them protection from the sun. It allows them just a little bit better camouflage in the desert as well. But they are actually this darker species. But sometimes we can show you in the picture when we walk over, they can be like a vibrant light blue color. Yeah. Uh, do any of the bugs or insects make noises other than hissing? Crickets do. <laughs> Um, I don't think anybody the rest of ours do. Yeah, the crickets that we feed them, Riley, or yeah. Aaron. Uh, spiders, actually, one of the ways they find a mate is by drumming their abdomen oh, yeah. on the ground, mm -hmm. and the female can hear it. It's just, we can't hear it, but scientists like have little tiny microphones to tell how spiders drum to see, hey lady, do you like my beats? Oh, very <laughs> cool. All right, spider beats. <laughs> Sounds like a band name. Spider. Alrighty, and Aaron actually has brought out another insect for us where Riley puts away the death painting beetle. Aaron, you know how much you have? Yeah, so this here is a walking stick, specifically a Vietnamese walking stick. You can tell because she looks like a stick. Now, something that you might notice, as I did say she, because I am 99.999% certain that this is a lady. Vietnamese walking sticks are super cool because they don't need boys at all. These guys can reproduce, well these ladies can reproduce through a process called parthenogenesis, which means when they lay eggs, those eggs have to exact copies of their mom, which is pretty cool. Now you might notice that she's standing pretty still. She's trying to camouflage. Walking sticks are masters of hiding, but they don't just look like sticks. They also try to act like them. You might notice her two front legs and the front are sticking straight out. And if they say a breeze comes along and starts to sway, then she'll start swaying with the breeze as well. Because a stick that doesn't move in the wind doesn't look like a stick. So that is our Vietnamese walking stick. One of my favorite mom jokes is uh, the last thing a stick bug wants to do is stick out. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, Erin. Riley has, what is down there, the scorpion? Assassin bug, what a great one. These are white spotted assassin bugs. These are other types of assassin bugs that we have here in Kansas. Um, and once I push them back, you'll be able to see them in the wild a little bit better. But I'm going to throw some crickets in here because they're kind of fun to watch eat. Um, when they prey, they have a long proboscis that they stick into the cricket and they kind of go to town. <laughs> Sometimes they'll even line up on the logs and they all have a cricket, but we'll see what they do today. Why are they called assassin bugs? They are called assassin bugs because they are really good at standing in ambush and hiding and then jumping out to catch their prey. And another cool fact is because they're called assassin bugs, they are actually a true bug. Bugs are actually a group within insects in the have that long proboscis, like Riley was saying, it's kind of like a straw that helps them suck up all of the stuff. Now there is insects and bugs like stink bugs that drink plant juices, but these lovely bugs like to go after other invertebrates. You can see it up on top of the log. Oh, we just lost it. That's okay. 
And these guys are found in Africa. But you said we have assassin bugs in Kansas? Yep. Oh, cool. Double types. They're a little more gray. They're not as striking, but yeah. pretty neat. Uh, what classifications or identifications do you need for an animal to be a true bug? I have a poster just for that. So here's a, a true bug that actually might be here in North Carolina. Is this if I'm looking at this <laughs> I think yeah, it might be a box elder one. Yeah. These guys also have that piercing mouth part, which is the key characteristic. Now this isn't like a mosquito where syringe that goes in and out. It's like a bendable straw, which then they push into their prey. And most true bugs also have a special wing. The part near their thorax is kind of hard, like a beetle's wing, while the end is membranous. And if you look right at this guy, you can see how he has that wing with membranous at the end and kind of harder at the beginning. And there isn't any good ways, but they also can tend to make an X with their wings like this and have a little triangle right here. And that's how you can identify a lot of cool bugs here in Kansas, from stink bugs to assassin bugs to ambush bugs, as well as our friends, the shield bugs. They have a piercing mouth part, special wings that make an X, a little triangle. Awesome, thank you for that, Erin. She loves her true bugs. I do. <laughs> um, Riley, are you gonna show us the water bugs? Yeah. So we don't have a whole lot of them in here right now, but here's a really good one right up here on the one right here. cork. And then they actually dive. So they go down to the water and swim around. And they, they can eat things like small fish, uh, but tend to go toward a little bit smaller. They eat crickets here. And what's really cool about these, this species is that the male takes So the females lay eggs on the male's back and they cement them in place. And there's actually a male back here, my hand once you get them there, with a bunch of eggs. And there's actually a, uh, see it right there. And there's even a couple offspring popping out of eggs huh. in the shot as well. And then once the eggs hatch or fail to hatch, eventually that egg case falls off. But there's a little baby one. Let's see. I saw a baby one earlier. On this really big right here. You can go from above if that's what you need. A little baby right there came out of an egg that size on that male's backpack. Back. Or that might be a couple days old. That's super cool. So Riley, can you talk a little bit about how you care for the bugs in here? Of the same things as the bigger animals, as you said earlier, right? Yeah, so we pick up the kind of like everybody else. Um, they require some humidity, so we miss their areas. Um, some of them get fruits and veggies. Some of them get crickets. And if they have really tiny babies sometimes that are carnivorous, they get um, fruit flies or pinhead crickets. Oh, wow. Alrighty, do we have any questions at home? There are so many invertebrate species. We could be here all day talking about them. Um, but does anybody have any questions at home relating to structures in invertebrates? Any of the ones we have at the zoo? Uh, do stink bugs have another name? Um, generally not. Stink bugs are kind of just known as stink bugs. There's a lot of different types of stink bugs, including native as well as invasive. The brown ones in your house are probably the brown marmorated stink bugs, which are from Asia. But my favorite are the green stink bugs. They don't like to go in your house. They just want to eat plants and drink all the juices. And they're really fun. Um, they are related to what's called shield bugs. And they're basically the same pentagon-ish structure. And they, a lot of them are basically herbivores. Well, we're going to your home diet and tell us what your favorite stink bugs are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's the blue one, the blue one. I mean, I did some research in 
undergrad with stink bugs, which is why I know too much about them. <laughs> Aaron loves bugs in general. I do. And other types of invertebrates. I have to, had to start saying that since she started working here. <laughs> um, okay. Do water bugs prefer fresh water or can they live in salt water? They live in fresh water. Not many insects can live in a salt water environment. So generally when you see a bug, it's going to live in fresh water. Or how many eggs do the water bugs lay? Uh, I have never personally counted them, but it looks like about 30, maybe more. I've never counted them. That's a good question. <laughs> That's a it's good guess. A yeah. yeah. That's a good guess compared to what's on their back when we see it. Um, and we also have jungle nymphs that are pretty cool to look at too. Do they make good pets? Uh, that depends on who you're asking mm -hmm. and which. I don't know. We can put it. Yeah. Them. So a lot, a lot of different insects, and as well as our friends, the tarantulas and other animals, can be pets. It depends on how you're caring for them. You have to make sure that you're getting them the right food the right water, and the right humidity. So our friends over here, the jungle nymphs, are a jungle species. So you can't just have one sitting around in a your room. It wouldn't do very well. No, right uh, there. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see them. So those are the big green. Oh, that's way better. <laughs> <laughs> Very good camera. Yeah, so it's right here. This is the jungle nymph. And this is a female. There is dimorphism in this species. So the females are huge and green and blend in with the leaves. And the males are a lot smaller and they are brown to blend in with the bark. But yeah, as Aaron said, this is a rainforest species. So they do need a lot more humidity. Look at that girl. They have um, such fascinating features on their head. They kind of look like little dragons or something. <laughs> uh, do bugs eat meat or plants? It depends on the species. Some are carnivorous, some are herbivorous, and then some don't even like either of those fresh. They're detritivores. They like eating dead things. The American burying beetle was actually the first insect put on the endangered species list here in the United States. And they like to eat dead things, as the word carrion suggests. And uh, how, how big do they get? Depends on the species. This lovely lady is about full size for a jungle nymph. The large, there is a species of walking stick that can get one to two feet. And it kind of just depends on the insect. And for, good news for us is they won't get much bigger than today. But there used to be, way back in time, a dragonfly that was the size of your forearm. But there isn't enough oxygen left in the atmosphere, high enough oxygen content in the atmosphere for those guys to exist anymore. The largest arachnid species is the goliath bird-eating tarantula, and it can get, with its legs out, the size of a dinner plate. But thankfully, they don't live in Kansas. <laughs> Although, I would, think I would love to see one, but they live down in South America. Uh, and what do jungle nymphs eat? All these leaves. <laughs> so this is viburnum. Uh, they really like the viburnum. They eat it really well. If you, this is was probably put in here yesterday, but if you look at some of the leaves, you'll see little sections that have been chewed out. They'll also, I think they also eat rose and ooh, something else. Pyrocantha, I think. But they really like the viburnum. And then. So one species of insect that we have here on grounds that isn't able to be seen is our Salt Creek tiger beetles. And that's a program we work with. Uh, it's an endangered beetle that lives in Lancaster County, Nebraska. It's the only place on earth that lives. And there are less than a thousand of them left in the wild. Uh, so we work with the Omaha Zoo and the Lincoln Children's Zoo and Nebraska Game and Parks and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and several other places. <laughs> um, to actually raise larvae in captivity, and then we end up releasing them in the wild. And I think we have 45 larvae right now that will hopefully go out next week and be released. All righty. Do we have any other questions from home, Megan? Like we said, we could literally be here all day with I invertebrate or bug zoo questions. There's just so many species, which is awesome. 
Hannah says, my friend loves bugs a lot. He loves to catch bugs too. <laughs> That's awesome. All of us also enjoy the bugs and the insects and the uh, arachnids. So please uh, take after your friend, Hannah. We all appreciate bugs. We don't want to kill them. Just